So welcome to Mastering Your Life with Plant-Based Nutrition. I am Jennifer Z, and I am honored today to be speaking with Jean Schumacher, who is one half of the Starch Queen. So Jean has a doctorate in science and education and has taught chemistry, biology, and environmental science for over 20 years. She successfully completed a certification in plant-based nutrition at E. Cornell Center for Nutritional Studies and has also completed coursework from Dr. John McDougall on the search solution. On top of that, she has also completed many courses through the Wellness Forum from Dr. Pam Popper. Uh, Jeannie believes wholeheartedly in walking the walk and has been plant-based since 2009. She has made it her mission in life to inspire and educate others who want to change their health destiny and reduce toxins in the body through plant-based nutrition. Jean, thank you so much for being here. I'm excited to talk to you about this very important topic. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. So you went plant-based in 2009. How familiar were you with plant-based nutrition and what made you start the journey? (laughs) Well, a trip to the emergency room was my my beginning. I think sometimes we have to hit that wall and, you know, oh, well, you know, this is whatever I'm doing is not working. So I was in, I had 105 degree fever. My blood pressure was off the charts and they never did find out what was wrong with me, really don't care. But the woman who was treating me was not only a medical doctor, but she was a nutritionist, which is such a rare combination in this world. So I really had no clue about plant-based living and the effects. I thought I was doing pretty good, apparently not. (laughs) So uh, after I got out of the hospital, I went to see her as a nutritionist and I haven't looked back. I mean, this is before Forks Over Knives. So she started me on prevent and reverse heart disease and then, you know, Forks Over Knives came out and, you know, the rest is history, as they say. And yeah, that's what what started me. And I haven't looked back. Right. So how, how important do you think it is for medical professionals to also understand nutrition? Mission critical. Hello. I mean, mission critical. It's what goes in is what is powering the body. I mean, let's put it this way. If you were at the NASCAR drive, you know, the competitions, you know, the Indy 500, Do you think they know the exact fuel and the best fuel ratio that goes into that sports car? Absolutely. And I think it's absolutely ludicrous that medical doctors don't have the first clue about what is the best nutrition for the human body. Right. And I mean, speaking from experience from a lot of my friends who went to med school, most of them, I would say 90% of them say that the nutrition component of their training is, you know, like maybe 1%. Right. So it should be, it should be a bigger part of it, much bigger. Because I mean, nutrition for treating the root cause of things, looking at the body as a whole, I, I feel is super important as opposed to, you know, waiting until later in life and then trying to treat the symptoms. and Exactly. So what type of challenges did you face when you started this plant-based journey? I think the biggest challenges was learning the food, learning what to cook, how to cook, how to cook without oil. That's always a big challenge because, you know, in the beginning you're like, what, how, you know, how, how do I do this? So I think just the transition of learning the lifestyle, how to make food that's amazing that without without having to add added oils or salts or sugar and adjust your taste buds because it takes a while to for your taste buds to change so that you're actually tasting the foods. I remember doing an interview with with Andrew Spudfit Taylor who ate potatoes for a year and I remember his the comment he made after eating just potatoes for a year and and tasting grapes again for the first time his senses and tastes had changed and he said, "Oh my god, were grapes always this amazing?" And, you know, you, you do, you start to taste the food and you actually really taste it. So, Right. And one thing that you do notice too, after going plant-based and when you are eating whole foods, um, personally, I don't put a lot of sauces or, you know, I don't use oils. You do notice when you go out and say you have a meal, even if it's a vegan style restaurant or they right. have plant options. I notice right away if there's too much salt in something. I definitely notice if there's refined sugars. 
uh, because my taste buds are so right. fine tuned now to pick up on stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so when you were hospitalized, you had incredibly high blood pressure. How do you think that your future would have shaped, been shaped had you not have met that medical professional who did have the nutritional background? I would have gone down the road of my parents. My father died of a, a heart attack or a stroke or whatever. I don't know. He, he dropped dead. Um, we never like found the cause. Don't really care. But he had, you know, heart disease. So I would have followed in that. I already had the high blood pressure to begin with, but this was off the charts. And then my mother had diabetes, type two diabetes. Um, so you know, I would have followed in that that same thing. My whole, my entire family is is morbidly obese. So you know, we get it on both sides. So it's you know. But I'm changing my health destiny and I've changed it so that I'm not going to have that. Right. Agreed. Now, what would you say to somebody who, a critic of the plant-based lifestyle, you know, who, who doesn't necessarily, you know, they, they don't necessarily understand plant-based living as a whole, Mm But, you know, they're believing in the paradigm sort of like, well, where am I going to get my protein? How am I, you know, will I be iron deficient? Like, what if I eat too many carbs? What is your advice or uh, your sort of rebuttal to somebody who has all of those concerns and is more of a critic of the plant-based lifestyle as opposed to, you know, embracing it? Well, I get the, you know, I get the question about protein all the time. I mean, it's one of the standard questions and, and I, my usual standard rebuttal is, do you even know how much protein you're supposed to have? That's my first off the cuff because I'm just kind of a, like a John McDougal, I'm in your face, you know, do you even know? And you're commenting about protein and worried about this, but do you even know how much protein you're supposed to get and what's the best kind of protein to get and the most absorbable and, and you know, so I have a conversation that way because the World Health Organization recommends 5% of your calories for protein. And here's the thing. We don't really store protein in our body. I mean, we get some in our muscles. But after that, if you have too much, you have to get rid of it. So you're you're going to pee it out and get rid of it that way. So you're putting a phenomenal stress on your, your kidneys. And who knows? I, maybe there's that correlation between the adult diapers that has now appeared in all the, you know, the major box pharmacies that you're, you're going to start to see this entire row of adult diapers. Could there be a correlation between the excess protein that we're doing? And we've been kind of marketed since the 1950s post-World War II, that we've got to have protein and, you know, a chicken in every pod. And, you know, so that became the centerpiece of the meal and thinking that the protein, and it is one of the macronutrients, don't get me wrong, carbohydrates, protein, fats, great. But when you start to look at that, you don't need much. It's a small amount. Same thing for the fats. So yes, the brain does need some fats, but it comes, everything has fats. Even a potato has fat, even broccoli has fat. And hey, guess what? That's about the right amount we need in our diet. So it's kind of like nature planned it that way. Hmm. So, you know, I kind of go into these conversations with people and just kind of, you know, go over each one and just say, do you even know how much you're supposed to have? You know, if you're concerned about if I'm going to be anemic, do you even know how much you're supposed to have in terms of iron? Do you understand the difference between, you know, heme and non-heme and how it's absorbed into the body? So we start those conversations and, you know, I start basically saying to help them on their educational journey. If you go to my website, starchqueens.net, there's a phenomenal, I got tired of people going, could you send me that website, you know, that link to this, what, you go to my website, it's there. So I put a lot of research, I've got a lot of cooking videos, I've got recipes, I've got interviews with a lot of people on there. So it's kind of interesting because I'm being interviewed today, so I'm usually the one interviewing, so anyway. Well, I I do notice that a lot of people who, being in the fitness industry, a lot of people ask me, how are you getting your protein? It's like, well, you know, where are you actually getting your fiber? Because you're talking about all this protein and, you know, meat has zero fiber in it. So, you know, if, if I don't feel like answering the question, I just ask them where they're getting their fiber and that sort of, you know. Right. And are you constipated? Because... Eating an animal-based diet, you're going to be constipated and have issues there. So, 
digestive well, issues and, yeah. and everything else that comes with that. And I think it's just knowledge, right? You know, I would say that more than half of the people I speak to about how much protein they actually need, they don't really know. And they think that it's considerably higher than it actually is. You know, there, exactly. there are going to be numbers like 30 and 40%, which is, you know, too much. It's, it's way too much compared right. to the five or, you know, like under 10%, it's 30% is a, uh, is a big difference. It is. What do you feel is the important part of maintaining a sustainable plant-based lifestyle? Hmm. Good question. I think getting the routine and getting, you know, getting into your, you know, I'm on autopilot now. So I think getting into that autopilot, I do a lot of batch cooking on the weekends. I have to literally have two instant pots going at the same time. And I have sleeves that go in the lining. I bought extra ones so that as soon as one instant pot's done, I pull it out and then pop in the next one. Boom. So I prepare a lot of food on the weekend and do a lot of batch cooking. I'm in the kitchen. I spend a couple of hours. It's my investment. I call it my wellness center in the kitchen because that's where wellness is going to begin. It begins by the food that's going in. Yeah, exactly. I think batch cooking is key to any sustainable diet, whether you're plant-based or not. And, you know, it saves you money. You're not going out all the time. You're eliminating the, the highly processed foods. And, you know, if you, if you integrate it as a part of your, you know, like weekly schedule, then it just becomes a habit. It's, exactly. you know, rather than a job. And I set aside a certain amount of time, one day a week, get, you know, I get my stepkids involved and kids love to help with stuff like that. And I find also if you incorporate that into their schedule and their lifestyle, chances are they're going to really, you know, they, they, you're empowering them to make their own food. So they're going to eat it. What, right. You know, exactly. Uh, exactly. Over, over just putting something on their plate and saying, eat this. Ew, uh, I don't like this. But if exactly. they have to cook it and make it, oh yeah, there's going to be a lot more vested interest in it. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And you're also preparing them for their adulthood and, you know, and, and, how to properly prepare a meal, how to schedule a meal, meal prepping. So with our family, we pick a night and we put everything together. We have little bowls so that the, the younger ones can sort of pick what they want. And there's some sort of like pride in, pride in making your own meals. So right. it's really nice. Well, and, uh, and carrying food with you. I carry my food. I carry a cooler with me at all times, my food and drink. And I always pack more than I can eat because sometimes I get delayed or something happens. I teach full time. So something happens that I can't teach or whatever. You know, I mean, if I have to, if something happens where I have to be at school for a longer period of time, then right. I will, you know, I've got extra food and I'm prepared. Exactly. And you're, and you're not in a position right. where you've run out of food you're, you're hungry. And it's sort of one of those things where I'm just going to grab whatever. Is exactly. Coming. And that's where you, where most people fall down because yeah. you're hungry, you're cranky, you're tired. I want something and I want it now. And Oh, let's, Oh yeah, there's McDonald's, you know, I'm just going to slide it. I'm just going to get a salad, you know, or something, you know, like that. But that's where you, you're, you lose the ability to focus and concentrate and make good choices. Right. I totally agree with that. So I've noticed, and I don't know if you have, but there's this shift where people are wanting to empower themselves uh, by, you know, controlling their own health and, and wellness. And like you said, you know, you're choosing your own health destiny. Right. Why do you think that that is sort of a movement that's starting now, as opposed to how things were were going say five or 10 years ago? Well, if you look at the people we're getting sick and like I was in, in a local health food store here and I was just shopping and I was reaching up and I saw this woman, she was kind of looking at the ingredients and I said, Oh, what are you looking for? You know, is there something, you know, cause I teach classes on, on how to read nutrition labels and, you know, so we started this conversation and, and turns out she had MS and my husband reversed his MS through whole food plant-based living. I mean, I have reversed. I had high blood pressure. I was on four medications for high blood pressure. 
gone. I healed my thyroid, which my doctor looked me straight in the eye and said, you'll be on this medication for the rest of your life. And I'm like, okay, no. But, and she's like, well, I've never have seen in my 25 plus years of being a doctor, I've never seen anybody heal their thyroid. Until now. <laughs> Until now. And her response in the beginning was, it must have been a bad blood test. Right. I right. got no credit. None, no, no credit at all. It couldn't have been from a diet. No, no, no changes to the health. So I've healed fatty liver syndrome. You know, I'm sure I had atherosclerosis without question. You know, I was, I was, I was a train wreck heading towards disaster and no question about it. So that was an intervention. Thank you to whoever for intervening and it helped to change my life completely. But I think there's so many people that I, I run into everybody sick. People are just sick. All the time, I, you know, you hear a conversation, oh my God, I got this, I got that. Something is happening. I, I'm healthy. I'm like, you know, my, and my girlfriends, you know, who I've known for like a long time will call me up and it's just, you know, she's already had, she's three days older than I am. And she's already had several strokes. She's got type 2 diabetes. And I've gone on over and I've done the intervention and I've helped her to change but she reverted back and, and uh, still calls me up to talk about her health issues. And I'm like, is anything good happening? Because that's like the whole conversation is, you know, people my age, I'm, you know, heading up into my 60s. People my age are like, everybody's sick. And it's not yeah. that we're living longer, we're dying slower. And I think people are starting to get pissed. Pissed that they're on the medical treadmill, angry, upset. That they're spending their life and their money. It's so expensive, even with health insurance, to to do this. We have a copay of four thousand dollars, a deductible that we have to meet first before anything is covered in, in our current insurance plan. It's like uh, what? So yes. you know, I have to pay out of pocket, and thank goodness I, we don't go to the doctors anymore. But if you do have to go, it's it's ridiculous. I think what's happening too is people are getting sick of being sick, yeah. uh, sick of the vicious cycle of, you know, getting sick, going on meds, feeling those side effects, you know, maybe the symptoms are being masked for a certain amount of time, but they're, the point they're is there. you're still sick. I was diagnosed with endometriosis and I was given, you know, three options, one being go on the birth control pill. Another being you, you can take pill designed for endometriosis, which had a crazy long list of side effects. And then the third option was have a baby and you'll get, a, uh, you know, like an eight month break from your endometriosis. And my response was, well, so, so then if I have a baby, I have a break, but then after the baby comes, so does the endometriosis. So like, what are we doing here? Are we getting rid of the endometriosis? No, because, you know, there's really no such thing, especially where mine is. And it's also, you know, okay, so if I'm masking the symptoms, right. which is excruciating pain, I was in and out of the hospital, and it's an inflammatory disease, why not mask it with food no, rather you're than healing it with food? Hormones. Not masking, you're healing. Exactly. So I have been living for over a year and a half with endometriosis with no symptoms whatsoever, just because I adopted plant-based nutrition. Awesome. And, and I was able to go off of a few other medications that I was on. Yep. So, you know, it's definitely empowering. And I think that, you know, by me doing this and sharing my story, other people are like, well, I want to empower myself too. And I, I don't want to be in the stranglehold of that vicious cycle of, you know, going on meds, going off meds, going on a different medication. Right. So right. it's definitely an, an, an empowering thing that you can do for yourself. And I think people are just seeing more and more of that. Well, and I can do things. Like, yeah. and it's not to say that I'm some, you know, super strong person. I'm not, you know, I'm not like this fitness specialist, but if I go out with, you know, on vacation, a lot of my friends go with me and we're, I'm in the process of my husband and I are buying a home on Cape Cod 
and we're going to turn it into a plant-based destination vacation, okay? Fall of 2020, coming soon. So, but because it's hard to travel this way and it live this way. So we're buying a home and we're going to open it up for people that want to learn about this lifestyle or just want to come visit Cape Cod. What an amazing place. Anyway, friends come up to Cape Cod with me and they can't go, they can't do the kayaking that I do. I mean, I go 10 miles without issue. I mean, we go out to some of the places way out where no one is and I love it. And, you know, kayaking or sailing, you know, they can't fit in my boat, um, you know, or they yeah. can't keep up with me. Not to say that I'm out this, you know, out running 20 miles. First of all, I don't run. Okay. That's the Nancy part of the Starch Queens. She runs. Uh, no one's, I'm not running unless a bear is after me. No, but I like to hike and I'm out biking, you know, 10 miles. People can't even ride 10 miles. Oh, that's kind of far. Uh, really? I, I guess I, you know, in college I used to do 100 mile loops and not think anything of it, but I'm not in college anymore. But not even 10 miles. It's like, really? Okay. And I want to keep doing that right up until the day I leave this planet. And, yeah. you know, and I don't want to have to worry about, you know, oh gosh, my back, ow, my knees. No, I'm not in pain. I'm I'm active. I'm doing. I'm being, and I'm loving life. Loving life. And I think I agree with you. And I think when people start embracing the plant based lifestyle, they do notice that they notice that their aches and pains start to subside. They do notice, uh, you know, this excessive energy, and they're able to participate in life. Exactly. In general. Uh, last question for you, Jean. Where do you see plant-based nutrition heading in the next five years? Well, it's going to be the it's going to be the basis, I think. There's just way too much research out there, and it's not just plant-based. I mean, we teach a lot in our program. We have a weight loss program, sqweightloss.com, and it's not just weight loss because weight loss is kind of like a side effect of this, and so. You know, people, there's a lot of people who need to lose weight, but more important is we educate and we educate what's called the trifecta. The trifecta approach is you have to change what goes in. So it's the food and drink. You have to change what goes on. That's the environmental toxins you're being exposed to. Like, for example, cleaning products or like creams, facial makeup. creams, makeup, shampoo, deodorant, toothpaste, all those things that we need. And if you're not checking the environmental working group, oh my gosh, huge resource there. They have the cosmetic database. They have a database for cleaning products as well. You can check them before you buy them. There's an app called Healthy Living. You can download that. It's free. I like free. Or just contact me. I'm a consultant for Pure Haven Essentials, which the entire product line, no toxins. Entire line. It's the only one that I know of that the whole company is toxic free whole company. So you, we talk about the trifecta. So you have to change what goes in. That's food and drink. You have to change what goes on. That's the personal care products, the environmental toxins you're being exposed to. And you have to exercise. I mean, those are the three points. There's no other points to changing your health, you know, meditation, what, you know, I, I get it, spirituality. But those to me are the three big ones that you really got to change to change your health destiny. So I right. see a lot more people shifting this way because the research is just out there. And I love Kim Williams. Uh, he was the former president of the American Heart Association. And he said, there's two kinds of cardiologists, ones who know the information and the research and the other ones who haven't read it. Yeah. So, and I agree. Once you start to understand the research and understand what's happening within your body and seeing how you feel, you can't go back. I mean, you know, once you start down this po path, I think, unless you get sucked back into the pleasure trap, because it is hard. It's hard to break the pleasure trap. You're being exposed to things. I did a whole series with Dr. Neil Barnard on the cheese trap. And if you've not seen that, oh my gosh. Because I broke down his book, The Cheese Trap. And if you watch this series, it's not gross or anything. But you just like, wow, didn't know that. Especially where the bacteria comes from. It's the same bacteria that they make cheese with that's in between the toes of your feet that make your feet smell. It's that bacteria. I would have liked to have been a fly on the wall of the first person who said... Yeah, let me stick my feet into this cheese bucket and see, you know, what, what happens. Hey, that tastes pretty good. Hmm. 
I don't know. Anyway, woo! <laughs> so I, I think, you know, I think there's going to be more traction. I think there's going to be more uh, people starting to realize and take changing their house, especially with all the videos that are out there, you know, forks over knives, what the health, you know, eating you alive. I mean, they're amazing. They're absolutely incredible. And conferences, I just came back from the National Health Association conference in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh my gosh. This, this organization has been around since the 1950s. This is their 70th conference. What? Where have I been? How long, how come I had never heard of this? organization they're just amazing and we had such incredible speakers the food stole the show though the chef at the the cleveland marriott oh my god everything was whole food plant-based sos and it was like the food was just incredible just absolutely incredible to die for food so you know and it was great seeing people and connecting with people that are just who want to live this way and are so happy to be off the medical treadmill and just embracing life. And that's all of us. I mean, we did things. They also not only had the conference, but they did things like they had Lolly the Trolley, you know, tours around Cleveland. But they also did yoga. And, you know, it was just, it was so amazing just to be able to connect with all these doctors. You know, Joel Furman was there, you know, just incredible. It was, it was really nice. Pam Popper. And I just have to put a plug in. If you've not taken, if you don't know, Pam Popper teaches these amazing courses at the Wellness Forum in Columbus, Ohio. She does them online. And every woman, I, I swear, it should be like the standard practice for every woman to have to, to take this course. I learned so much, especially about being a woman. Your endometriosis, boom. You know, you would have learned about it right there. And all the issues, because we do have issues that men don't. And this was a powerful course starting from the beginning to the end. And I think one of the things that resonated with me was probably the most disturbing statistic that she presented. The average age that children are starting to, their period, their period, starting to menstruate, the average age is 50% of them are between seven and eight. Wow. What? That's that is second so grade. Second that grade. Can you imagine your seven-year-old coming home? Absolutely must be scared out of her mind because she's got blood coming out of her. Right. What? And you, they're not meant, meant, you know, ready for this. Mentally, physically, emotionally. I mean, if you look at plant-based cultures around the world, usually it's like 16, 17 years of age when you start your childbearing ages. Not at seven. At seven. What? That, yeah, that, that is mind blowing. And, you know, and then, and then you're menstruating for an even longer period of time. Yeah. And it has an impact. It has a huge impact on our life, on our health. And yeah, I can't say enough. So Pam Popper's got some amazing courses at the wellness forum. She's just incredible. So check out the Cle the national health association as well amazing institution. I will be back there next year because that is, it was just a profound conference for me. It just really brings, it helps you connect and reaffirm why you want to do this and it, connecting with other people because it's so hard when you're out here and, and you feel like you're by yourself. Hello? Hello? Is there anybody out there? Because it's, it's, yeah, it's, and that's one of the reasons why we started our program, the Starch Queens Weight Loss Program. It's more about education because I'm an educator and I will blow you away with educational topics. Woo! So, yeah. Anyway. Jean, thank you so much. My for pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, it was wonderful to meet you. And I will definitely be seeing you next year at the conference. Oh, wonderful. Love it. And they have an early bird special coming up. I think August 1st, they're going to open up registration for next year. So they have Beautiful. an early bird price. And I can't say enough. We got there early and they ended up doing extra. They pulled together Thursday night, a QA and a with all the doctors that were in town. And then Vitamix set up a huge like hors d'oeuvre snack, you know, kind of thing. And it was really nice. So that was an additional thing. And all the other extras of the conference were just spectacular. So can't say enough, but thank you for having me. Oh, thank you.